All right, we left off talking about oil change intervals. And we want to change the oil on regular intervals because of the acids and moisture and lead and all the nasty stuff that builds up in the oil. And um, we talked about Continental says, even if you really haven't used the oil, if it's been sitting around for several months, change it before you start it because it's all full of moisture and you don't want to disperse that around the engine. Uh, so how often do you change oil? What does the manual say to? Engines with a screen. Twenty-five. So some engines have spin-out oil filters. This is actually a small one, with just like your automobile, your car would have, with pleats on the inside. Yeah, groovy, huh? <clears throat> so it has pleats on the inside, paper pleats, and that collects all the contaminants. Some of them just have a screen. Hmm. So if you have just a screen, engine with a screen, um, <clears throat> engines with a screen have oil changed every, how often? 25 hours. 25 hours. Not to exceed four months. Engines with a, we call them full flow oil filter. <coughs> full flow oil filter are changed every 50 hours. So if you get one of those spin spin on conversion kits that Larry had that he huh? got in trouble with, yep. Can you go from 25 to 50? Absolutely, it's got a full flow. That's why you do it. Well, that and better filtration. All right, not to exceed, not to exceed four months. And some engines still require every 25. There are a few engines out there, um, probably the, the Lycoming TIOs, turbocharged, injected, opposed, are every 25 hours. So you have to watch that in the maintenance manual. Make sure that you have uh, an engine that will go over 50 hours. So Not for a given weight rating of an oil, if it drops down or above, or so down below a certain temperature, do they require you to change it due to the uh, dissolution of it, mm -mm. breakdown of it? Nope. Don't say anything. Not that I'm aware of. Uh, I will say, do not forget, and many, many mechanics don't do this. Do not forget the suction screen. Continental does not have a suction screen that you can get to. You guys have maybe seen the suction screen, I think I'm one or two floating around that goes on the end of the, the suction tube yeah. that goes down. It's got the big cap there on the bottom of the oil sump for the light combing. Every oil change, I would take that out and check the suction screen. Uh, Continental, my engine has got a large flat suction screen, just like it would on a car. Uh, kind of sits down at the, the bottom. Yeah. It's down the bottom of the oil pan and it's bracketed and, and you can't get to it unless you pull the oil pan. Uh, you have a standpipe with just a welded on strainer. So you can't get to that stuff. So Continental, you can't get to it, but like coming, you're expected to look at it. So don't forget the suction screen. Some crazy so stuff has been found. Continental, would that be uh, user friendly or were they just like these people are too stupid to know how to do it? <laughs> I have no idea what their thought was. Uh, Continentals just, you know, big bore Continentals look so different. I mean, you know, my oil pan is that long by, a, you know, that thick. It looks like a car, just, you know, looks like a car oil pan, uh, unlike the light combings, which you guys have seen. So it's just very different. Uh, let's see, got that with the suction screen. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about filters and screens. I have a lot of notes here, but really Larry is going to cover this 
Identify LTE filters, screens. So I'm going to let him really take the lead on this one rather than taking a bunch of time. Um, we do have different types. We have the what type? Full flow. Okay, full flow, which we just talked about, or sometimes we call it a spin on. Spin on. You know what's weird is our spin ons have to be safety. And there are many, many reports of you don't safety it, they come apart. That does not happen on cars very often, unless you have your, but I do hear about it. I think they just weren't put on well, but anyway. To yeah, they're hardly even on there. Ours are torqued to 200 inch pounds, if I'm not mistaken, roughly. And <laughs> inch, 200 inch, not a lot. I was trying to remember, it's the lowest setting on one of my torque wrenches. It says right on there. 15 to eight, 16 to 18 foot pounds. And have to be safety, or they come apart. Uh, let's see, we have the screen type, which I just showed you, screen. And I'll throw in this one, the Qno. It's kind of an interesting thing, is a stacked disc of a thing. And this is what it looks like. So there are these stacked discs right here. And the space between them dictates the filtering ability, right? So whatever that space is, is how big that thing can get through there. So what's interesting about this, if you look at it, it's got a little handle up on here. And it probably needs to be oiled before I turn it. But it has cleaners, brushes in there. So when you change the oil, you go in here and you rotate this thing. And you rotate the stacked disc between these cleaners and it pushes <coughs> everything out. And then that falls down and you open this up and the mm. stuff falls out. And then every now and then you take it apart and wash it real well. So, uh, so try not to, uh, you can turn it a little bit. Or anything? Uh, if you take it out, you can do that, but I wouldn't back to what's on the airplane. Are they really closing the No, it'd be something on like a radial engine or something. Old timey engine. Stack disc, uh, space between the discs determines minimum particle size that will be filtered. So, space. between disks determines a particle size to be filtered. Off the top of your head, do you know what the smallest particle size they can get down to? No, I don't. You know, send my like microns and I don't even have that information. Um, what do I want to say? Okay, I'll get to that. Um, Location. So a lot of this stuff is on your Q&A to ask where is this, where is that. So where is the location of things to be filtered? So if you're going to put a filter or a screen, where does the manufacturer put said filter and or screen? Uh, immediately after the pressure pump. I think it would be very difficult. F well, I'll, I'll tell you why, and it makes sense. Well, I'll just tell you now. I was gonna, it's like our next thing. Um, bypass. So you have to have some way to bypass it. If you put the screen on the suction side, number one, you're pulling a suction on the screen or filter, which could cause it to collapse. You want pressure going through it. And so not only do you want pressure to go through whatever you have, this or this or that, but you want, if this gets completely clogged, you want some way to bypass this. So dirty oil is better than no oil, right? Your engine's coming apart. It's like, well, we don't want to ruin it anymore. No, so um, either it's got a bypass built into this, which this one doesn't, or the adapter this screws into has some sort of pressure bypass. You can see the one on there. There's a ball and a spring. So when the pressure exceeds that ball and spring, you should look, that ball is going to press up off the seat and the oil is going to go right past those stacks and right in the engine. It comes in one side, through the ball, out, boom, no filter whatsoever. So the funny thing is, like your engine, A65s or anything with a screen, try to find the bypass. You will never find it. And it wasn't until I actually went to Lycoming school when they were talking about this. I'm like, where the hell is the bypass on one of these? 
It's the solder joint. What? The solder oh, it joint. It's, the, it's a blowout joint. Okay. Yes. It is designed for a certain pressure. So I said, if you ever see a solder joint go bad, don't resolder it because it's an actually calibrated blowout. So this one's been blown out. So um, now Lycoming goes from the outside in. Nope, inside, inside out. out. Inside out. I had to picture it. It goes inside out. So when you pull this out, all your stuff's going to be inside here. But a Continental goes outside in. So what happens is it's just like you guys have that housing. Continental has something very similar. It's just a big screw cap. And you pull this out and you go, well, that doesn't look too bad. And you go and you clean it and you put it back in. But where was all the debris? On the inside, inside of the housing. Inside the housing. It fell off. So there have been times where I pull it out and go, okay, we're looking good. That's super clean. Put your finger in it. Ow, crap. And you just pull it all kinds of metal just packed in the bottom of it. It all hit the screen and all the heavy stuff fell to the bottom. So you always <clears throat> have to check the Continental. Wipe it in there. <coughs> um, with these things, as you can see, the spin-ons, you are supposed to, by a can opener, cut it open, pull this part out, cut the pleats, inspect the pleats, and take a, you can take a clean one of these, wash it in some clean uh, solvent or fuel, and then take a magnet on the outside of the cup, don't stick it in, see what's metallic. You get a lot of, it, it's, You'd be surprised how much you really get, and it's, it's a little scary, uh, but more often than not, like you take a magnet and you're like, dang, look at all that, that can't be good. Half or more of it is just fuzz from this, sticking to a piece of metal, so it's not always that scary, but you really shouldn't see many particles or anything on there. I'll give you some exacts. Oh, that was one of the... Not the worst I've ever seen, <laughs> but one of the worst. Uh, bypass. Uh, must have, must have a bypass, no matter what it is, to allow, to allow oil to flow, oil, oil to flow, if it becomes clogged, if. Once bypassed, <coughs> once bypassed, oil flows at a normal rate, a normal rate, but is unfiltered. So would you be able yeah. to look at your oil pressure kind of slowly going down and then shoots back up and you would think that would be most people wouldn't be watching it that close. Yeah, like how would you know? Yeah, it's, it's like, just okay. when you change it. Oh, it got better. <laughs> when yes. you change it, you're like, oh, shit. So, uh, yeah, I was going to kind of ask about that. Um, wouldn't there be something that tells you or indicates to you, like, hey, you, oil's flowing through the bypass, or would that you have to catch that at like, an inspection or something? Catch it in inspection. <clears throat> yeah, you wouldn't know. Uh... Yeah, I don't know if I told you this story. One time, one time, started out that one time, I overhauled a light combing, I don't know, 360, I think it was, 360, 320, four-cylinder light combing. And uh, it was a nice overhaul, took it out to the test stand, ran it on the test stand, and I don't have the book here, but you know, look in chapter 10, it tells you the, the run schedule. So, I don't know, something like an hour or something to get to full power, and you run it for full power for, I don't know, 15, 20 minutes. Then you shut it down and then you, you drain the oil and I would always pull the filter off at that point, cut it open, inspect the new engine. Um, you weigh, you drain all the oil and you weigh the oil and then you put a new filter on and then you pour that oil back in and then you do a full power run for like an hour at, at wide open throttle. And then you weigh the oil again and you see how much oil you consumed and you're only allowed a certain parameter, which I never had a problem with that. So anyway, did that, 
um, first run, draining the oil, pull the spin on off, cut it open, open it up. It's like, oh my God. It was like somebody had ground this up and took all the metal shavings and put it in there. I mean, it was just packed full of aluminum. It, was, it seemed like that much. Someone had what? a birthday party in there? Huh? Someone had a birthday party? Oh, it was horrific. On a brand new engine that was supposed to go out, you know, in two days, all that aluminum, and it's like, you know, I built it. You know, it was just me. So it's like, what the hell? You know, and so boss is not happy at all. And uh, so I take the whole thing apart. And I really couldn't find anything. This is really weird. And it's been a long time. And I'm trying to remember the whole story. But I remember it was a brand new crankshaft. And I had the crankcase surface and line board. And so we uh, couldn't figure it out. And so I want to say I sent it back to ECI, who had built the crankshaft and did the, the line bore. So thankfully I had the same machine shop as the, produced the crankshaft. So I sent it back because we couldn't find aluminum anywhere. So we figured it was coming from somewhere in the case. And uh, there's a little bit of shininess and <clears> there's <throat> something up in the, the bearings here uh, area. And so we sent it back and they called right after they got it and said, oh my gosh, we are sorry. But we found a machining problem in the crankshaft. Uh, the crankshaft or the case, and it wasn't putting a radius in one of the two things as it was supposed to. The machine got out of calibration, and it had caused that. So they paid for me to overhaul the engine again. I mean, they paid all of our labor, gave us all the parts. I mean, just totally took care of us. So I rebuilt this engine, put it on the test stand. Same thing. I mean, it was just it was like, you know, you're pulling the screen going, ha, bet it's good this time. Like, no freaking way. And so I called them up, and they're like, you got to be kidding. I'm like, I don't joke about this kind of stuff. I said, uh, they're in, like, Washington, I think. I said, they, we will be there in the morning. And so, yeah, they showed up you know, with an engineer and a, a head of something and somebody else, and they inspected everything we did, looked at it, boxed it up, said, we'll give you a call, took it back to Washington with them, did something, said, yeah, it's still our fault. Here's all the money to do it again, and all the parts to do it again. <clears throat> so, that's why I did it a third time. <laughs> How did you run the third time? Perfect. <laughs> well, they fixed their problem, it sounds like. Fixed their problem the by the third time I figured out how to build a light combing, so it was great. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. If, if, if you find a, a screen that has been bypassed, uh, like, do you run it? All right, let's think about why it bypassed. Why did it bypass? High pressure. You have so much material in the screen and the filter that it can't even let oil through anymore. You've completely clogged the screen up with what? Metal from the engine. Right? So what do we do at that point? Rebuild. Overhaul. It is great. Consider overhaul. <laughs> <laughs> if you choose to continue to fly, you better get good life insurance because it is going to crash. So if it's bypassed, you're done. Yeah. Remove and replace engine. Yeah. It's not the fact that it bypassed. It's the fact that it... So it's an overall... That it has to have material in it to need to bypass. It clogged the filter. So it's telling you... It's, it's, like, your ma it's like a maintenance <clears throat> required light. It's screaming at you. If, if you open a filter up like that... I, if it was my engine, I'd probably go white, thinking I'm lucky to be alive because this could have happened in the air and it could have seized up on me. I'm very thankful that it ran long enough to get me on the ground, and you know I discovered this now because <clears throat> you're going to discover it eventually. We're done. Uh, okay, so oil filter slash screen. Wait, I didn't get how you check on a spin-on filter how to check if it's on bypass. Is you, you don't check yeah. anything on bypass. No, you can't, but you the only it. thing that you can check bypass is this one because okay, it blew apart. Okay. Okay. So that one that's coming around, the little ball comes off the spring. But guess what happens when you yeah, stop the right engine? It goes, goes back down. down. So you can't Same stuff it. with this. It's a little ball or flap on a spring. And when it's done bypassing, it sets back down. Uh, <clears throat> so I think I do have. Let me see. Again, uh, hydraulic oil systems, we had, we had a, a poppet valve, like a delta P valve. Mm -hmm. And when that popped, that stay popped to let you know, hey, something's wrong here. Yeah. So let's look at a, a simplified diagram here. So 
we stop and kind of get oriented to what's going on here. We have oil coming in from where? From the sump. Okay, it's going to go into the gear housing through the middle, right? Yeah. All right, to the outside. And then it's supposed to go into the filter where it goes through the filter, up and out, and to the engine. All right, in the perfect world there. But meanwhile, what else is happening? Well, if the pressure here builds up too much, let's go normal, normal operation. So normal operation around the outside, this is closed during normal operation, through the screen, up through here, oil here. Well, let's say we only wanted 60 PSI, but this pump is really pumping, and I've got 100 PSI in this little line right here. What happens? Really this right here opens up enough to leak it back down to the inlet side of the pump. Right, maybe it's going to go actually down into the sump. Maybe it just comes around to the inlet side of the pump. But this right here, relief valve, just it's a caliber, it's a leak. So now it's going to leak off oil to drop the pressure down. So what's going up to the engine is at the pressure we want it. Keep in mind with this kind of stuff that the spring is just a spring, and the more you push it, the harder it gets to push. So you just need to consider this moving forward. It's not perfect. So if I said, I want 60 PSI out of it, and I'm running it at one speed, and I'm getting 60 PSI, and I double the speed of the pump, what's going to happen? Is it going to stay at 60? It's going to increase to 62, 65. I don't know. It's going to go up a little bit because this will open up. But it's got to press harder on it to do that. Um, let's say I took the speed of this thing, and I just, you know, it was running at 100 RPM and now it's running at 10,000 RPM. What is my oil pressure going to do? Uh, who knows? It's going to go, the sky's the limit because this only opens, the relief valve only opens so far. At some point, it's like, I'm doing the best I can. I've opened up as much as I can. There's nothing I can do. Pressure's just going to build up, right? Because it's a what kind of pump? Constant displacement. Constant displacement. All right. Um, also, what happens if a uh, piece of safety wire breaks <laughs> off, finds its way through here, and decides to lodge itself right there? Now you got a leak, so your oil pressure is going to go yeah. down. down. Okay, so we've, we're having a catastrophic failure, and metal is coming up it, down in the sump. This is sucking up the metal, <coughs> pulling it through here. It's packing up our oil filter. Then what happens? Uh, right now, no oil can get through this way, so the pressure builds up, pushes this. Now it comes up this way and goes that way. We shut the engine down. This does what? Closes. Again. Closes. Well. Oh. Bypass is closed. Guess it's fine, right? That doesn't work that way. Yeah. Uh, do they make hydraulic relief valves instead of just spring relief valves? And do they put a sensor on bypass valves for when it opens? I'm sure there are planes that do that. For both? Okay. <laughs> yeah. Probably are. Probably helicopters. Probably I do not know. Uh, what is very common are chip detectors. So a chip detector is two magnets, positive, negative, and they have an electrical contact, and they're looking for continuity. So if a piece of metal happens to go across both of them or bridges the two, then you're going to get a light, chip detector light. That's, that's pretty common. All right, so that's kind of how that works. Let me see. And that could be placed wherever in the oil system pretty much. Too. Wherever, they, wherever they deem it necessary. Uh, oil free inspections, let me see. Some material is normal. You're behind, dude. What's up? Seven was like the most important point I had. I don't know. It sucks. Uh, <laughs> I know. Most important thing. Uh, some material is normal. So you're not going to open up this, this filter pack and, you know, what it looks like there. It's, that's, this one's pretty clean. You're going to see some stuff in there. What are you going to see? God, I hope not. You see a lot of carbon in there. Carbon flakes, which are black flakes in there. So you're going to see that. Um, occasionally see a little tiny fleck of metal or something. You shouldn't really see much of anything. I mean, the engine's not supposed to produce metal. But a little tiny bit is... Yeah, well, that was my next point, especially after overhaul. <coughs> the trend is the most important.
Trend is most important. You want to know what the trend is. Unless you open it up and it's completely packed, don't go flying again and go, I wonder what the trend is. <laughs> so you want to, you can have some, um, let's see, what do I got? Um, Lycoming says the rule of thumb. So more than a thumbnail, more than a thumbnail. Uh, of material is bad. Define that. I don't know. Does it cover your thumb? Does it pile up on your thumb? Whatever you can pile that. I don't know. One piece the size of your thumb. Uh, it's got a part number on it. I don't, you know, it's like, but I'm telling you what Light Cummings said. Uh, cause should be always, uh, cause should be identified and corrective action take. Oh, yeah, this is from the QA. Cause should be uh, identified. How are you going to figure out the cause? Overhaul what material it is. How do you know what material it is? Magnetic or color? Or yeah, so in the chrome? field, we can d pretty much determine if it's magnetic or non-magnetic. But if you take the material and send it back to the factory or some places, uh, factor, I think the factory is the only one that can do it. You send it back to the factory. Uh, they will actually use some sort of electron microscope and determine exactly where it came from. Spectrogram. That's the word I wanted. Uh, spectrogram. Not, what about Blackstone? Is the same thing? I don't think they can because they don't necessarily know the composition oh. of the material that the factory used. It gets down into that. Oh, so maybe they'll tell you something and then you send another sample to the factory if it's like looks like. Yes. <clears throat> so Q&A says, what do you do if you get excessive metal? Cost should be identified, a corrective action taken. Oh, prior to further flight, I'm sorry, prior to further. Uh, I say check the manual, <laughs> check the manual, which includes service bulletin and letters because service instruction 1429 Delta has some great information in there on what to do. Uh, but you're going to look at it in the field and consider the source or consider the material, I guess, consider the, the material. Uh, massive amounts of red fuzz. Massive. Somebody left a rag in the engine. Somebody left a rag in the engine. That happens way too often. Usually you get catastrophic failure. <laughs> Why they put a rag in the engine? Because they're worried about dirt. So they shove one in or wrap it around the conrod. So I'm not a big proponent of that. Count your stuff. You know, leave a flag, do something. Um, I made that one up. If it's ferrous. Well, if I have, so I have ferrous. So I wash my filter. I uh, take a magnet on the outside and I can bring it up and I can see how much I have in there. It's, uh, you know, a lot of ferrous material. What are my sources? Now it's an engine that's been running for a while. It's not a fresh overhaul. What's my number one culprit? That's ferrous? Yep. Crankshaft or camshaft? Pick one. Crankshaft and crank. Cam. Lifters and cam. Number one source, especially for light coming. After that, rings and cylinder walls. That'd be much finer. Part. Bigger particles would be lifters and cam. Uh, Non-ferrous. Piston pins. Piston pins, I guess. Oh, man. Look at you guys. Piston. Piston pin plugs, number one. Number two, I'd say piston pin, pistons. That's what I meant to say, pistons. Uh, three bearings, which could be case uh, where the cam goes or something like that. Uh, let's see, I do the uh, soap. Soap, which is Spectrometric oil analysis program. Uh, 
Well, let's see, and I already said if the filter does clog, an oil bypass filter will allow unfiltered oil into the engine because it's what? I didn't hear what you said. It's completely clogged, it's a lot of material. Uh, if the filter does clog, an oil bypass filter does what? Opens. Opens, allowing? Dirty oil. Dirty, to, dirty oil to go to flow through the engine. Why would we allow dirty oil to go through the engine? Better than nothing. Dirty is better than nothing. Eleven. <laughs> Types of oil delivery. So does your Lycoming O290 all on its own allow unfiltered oil into the engine? Or, you know, after the pump, it goes to the stream. Oh, not all, not all of it. Some of it goes into the accessory case. Oh, yes, it does. It, goes into, the, it goes into the, the idler gear. Pressure yeah. feeds the idlers. Yeah. What the fuck's up with that? All right, types of oil delivery. What do we have for types of oil delivery? If we think about your engine, what, is, what do we have? All right, so we have pressure. What is what is pressure oiled? From the pump. Bearings. Or journal. Oh, yeah, yeah, your bearings. Yeah, so on all but the 290, the, all the bearings. So all the crankshaft bearings. What else? Camshaft bearings. Camshaft bearings. Rod journals. Rod journals. Idler gears. Idler gears. Tappets. I was looking for tappets. No. Uh, no. O290 is not. I said everything but the O290. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> well, and the O235. So the O235, O290. The only, only in radials, I guess, to a point. So, so bearings. Let me see. Tappets, push rods. Tappets, push rods. Push rods. Rocker arms. Yours just happens to be kind of catch and drip. Oh yeah, pressure. We have the piston cooling nozzles. Yeah. All right. Uh, we have splash in there. What do you got for splash? Small end cone rod. Okay, so that's piston pin. To a point. I mean, if the if you got the piston pin cooling nozzles, it's spraying on it, but. Close enough. Uh, piston pin. Uh, guides. That's more of a drip. I have that under drip, so I'll put Your that teeth. in. It says in our book that there is either two, it says there's either pressure fed or splash fed. It's one or the other, or a combination of both of the engines. So like I can see that, but I got it laid out here, so Tappets don't consider yourself wrong. Right. What's that? Tappets specifically for the O290. And yeah. O295. How about just the cam lobes? On pretty much all engines. Yeah. Yeah. Cam lobes. So that would be cam lobes and lifter face. They're just splash. Um, we got oh gears. Gear teeth. Yeah. They're just splash in the back there. Um, if I said drip. Drip drip drip. What do we? I uh, valves. Um, splash. Piston rings. Yeah, then I did spray. And I'm not going to like have some test questions. It's like the difference between them all because it's, what, what you said is, you know, it's really, it's either pressure oil or it's not in the way I like to think about it. But we're just breaking it down here because we can. So spray, well, it could be pistons. If you have piston cooling nozzles or drilled con rods, um, rings. If you have that, if not, then it goes back to uh, splash. Um, sometimes gears, if they got a spray on there. So we just got to think about how everything gets its oil. I don't think I have this in my notes anywhere, but and I, I don't remember if I talked about it with you guys. So my my engine holds. Well, I mean, of course you got you have a six quart, right? Four. Four, four. It's three and a half. It's they say it's four, but the half quart was please right out. That's what I'm going for. Yeah. So you only put three. 
It's a Petrina. That's the smallest one. I always thought there were six was the smallest. I swear. He's just got a lot of sludge. <laughs> that you know about. Yeah. Got a dented oil. <laughs> so mine holds 12, and I always put in, uh, when I do an oil change, I will put in nine quarts, and then when I run it and check the dipstick, it says eight, because one stayed in the uh, oil filter. I have a giant oil filter. Uh, why not 12? Well, you talk to anybody, and it's funny, when I got into the industry, you know, new guy, and hey, you got to do an oil change, and you look at the dipstick, and it's like, this takes eight quarts, so eight. And then the owners would always show up and goes, what the hell? Why would you put in eight, man? It's just going to spit out, you know, the, the first two quarts. And I'm like, well, it shouldn't. I mean, I didn't say that, but I'm thinking, well, who would design an engine to say it holds eight quarts and it's going to spit out two? You got something wrong with your engine, man. Um, it was in my head. But, you know, enough pilots say that. You're like, okay, then I guess they do. But, you know, this doesn't make sense. I never heard of a car that did that. So, you know, <laughs> it, doesn't, it burns it. There's a difference. It doesn't burn the two quarts or the whatever. It just literally spits it out. And so the owner's pissed because now they're going to spend the next few weekends wiping the oil that you put in the engine off the belly because that's where it's going to go. It just runs down the belly. And uh, so, you know, it took me the longest time to figure out really what's going on. And a lot of it has to do with how engines were certified. They're certified with X number of quarts in it, you know, they're, and they're run on a test stand in sort of a controlled environment. Well, you take it and you put it on an airplane. What's the one thing airplanes do the cars don't? They go straight. Yeah, you, uh, very high angle. So all that oil sloshes to the back. What's in the back of your engine? Your train. Gears. gears. So those gears, that oil level then comes up in the back, and those gears start spinning. They're spinning? They didn't start. And that aerates the oil, and it creates this massive amount of oily this spray all over the inside of the engine that's pressurized. And so now you have this oil-saturated air inside of the crankcase that is positive pressure, and it goes out the vent tube. So that's how it picks up the oil and shoves it out the vent tube. So by running it on a lower level, it doesn't hit the gears on some engines and then create as much of an atmosphere soaked with oil and spit it out. So it is true. Yeah. We had the opposite problem. So we would, pilots would always be like, oh, our fluid's low. You need to fill it to service max. So we'd fill it to service max, even though we knew it was going to happen. And then they start ground turning and they run inside. Our aircraft's leaking. Our aircraft's leaking. No, your, your fluid got hot and it pissed out when you were <laughs> ground turning. And now it's right back where we started. Yes. Is it half? I can't remember. Yes. That's not something that I commit to memory. It's like, oh, how low can I run my air? But you're right, though. There is like some formula whereby it can go to half that and still be okay. Um, I've heard that my engine would actually run as low as two quarts. That's not something I'm going to ever try. <laughs> so, yeah, I, I mine sits at eight, and when it gets to seven, I add a quart. And it's right between seven and eight on the dipstick at all times. Metal making up for that extra? Yeah, what's that? Is the metal making up? The metal, the metal making up for, yes. <laughs> All right, so we do have different types of oil systems. We can really categorize it into two, wet sump and dry sump. So we can start with the wet sump. The wet sump engine, which is the most typical, and that's what you have is a wet sump system. So if we look at a wet sump system here, this would be a Continental, looks like an O300. We have, da, 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 let's see, we should have, there we go. There's our gears right there, oil pressure. Let me see. I don't love this. Oh, oil filter. Now it's got to come up from the sump, through the gears, out of the gears. What's the next thing it's going to always hit? Filter. Um, filter or oil relief, yeah. pressure relief. Oh. So it's usually one of those. So, all right, so pressure relief. I can't tell where they put this one in the, in the system. Uh, filter, out of the filter. This one has it going through the oil cooler, through a, a temperature control valve I call the vernotherm. I'll talk more about this stuff. And then off to the oil galleries. After the oil galleries, it drops down into the sump, returns back to the inlet side of the pump. Uh, that's his oil sump pickup. 
some ways this drawing makes almost no yeah, sense. <laughs> yeah, what the hell is that? They, it's the, yeah, it's vegetarian, yes. It looks like a rat feeder. <laughs> <Water feeder. laughs> and why is the oil filter like that? And where is the oil coming from? Well, we, there's just things we know, right? We know that the oil has to go through the pump, and then the next thing is? Well, oil relief valve and filter. So filter through a control valve. What the control valve is, this is Lycoming's control valve. They call it a vernotherm, just so you don't know what they're talking about. A lot of ADs on these vernotherms, and uh, they're only like $800 each, which is a lot of fun. Um, only? Yeah. So what happens is they grow when they are hot and shrink when they are cold. And, and Continental does the same thing. Very, so you will have two passageways open for the oil. So one way it can go through the oil cooler and the other way is to go direct to the engine. It doesn't show it here. So oil cooler, engine. Then it goes to the oil cooler engine, right? So it meets up and then goes into the engine. So when it's cold, this will be shrunk and open up a passageway so the oil can go either which way. Now, because it's cold and viscous, it's not going to want to go through the oil cooler. Oil cooler has very small passages, kind of hard for it to get through. So the oil's got two ways to go, through the oil cooler or the easy way to the engine when it's cold. Which way is it going to go? Easy. easy way. And then as the oil starts to heat up, it heats this up and this grows and it blocks off the passageway going to the engine. So now it's forced to go through the oil cooler to get cool and then off to the engine. Then off to all the bearings and then back to the sump. Does that cause your oil pressure to go up? No. You see a fluctuation in oil pressure because of the temperature, which is a function of that, but I, I don't see a one-on-one. -on -one. This is your Lycoming. So I think this is a better drawing because it's out of the Lycoming book. Let's see. What do we got? Suction screen, which we do what with every now and then? We check it. We check it. Yes. Goes the oil pump. Ignore the prop, Governor. Uh, oil cooler bypass, what I just said. It's got two choices, either off to the engine or oil cooler. So when it's open, you have two passageways. When it's closed, it has to go through the oil cooler. Oil cooler. Continental bolts their oil coolers right up to the engine with no hoses. Lycoming likes to use hoses. That's a failure point in my book. Anyway, very next thing is the pressure screen, pressure screen or... Filter. filter. So screen is not the same as a, a filter. Screen is a screen. Filter is a filter. All right. Then from there, we have just some ports going off to vacuum drive pads. Next thing we see is the oil, relief valve. oil pressure relief valve, which is what on your engine? Ball and spring. So how do you adjust the oil pressure? Spring, spring, different spring, yeah. If you throw a penny in there, then it'll cart it and press. Quarter inch washer. So the newer Lycomings have a bolt in there, uh, adjustment screw, where you can just walk up to it and adjust, you back off a little nut, screw it in. There's a plate that goes in there and screws against the uh, spring, putting more pressure onto the ball, increasing your oil pressure. The ones you have are messy. You've got to take it off and put washers. You stack washers inside there, then put it back in. That's what you're allowed to do. I was joking about that. No, it's actually what it says. If you look at the parts book, it says AR, which stands for? As required. No. Oh. <laughs> Looking at AR does not stand for armor light. It stands for? As required. All right, so oil pressure relief valve. We now know how to adjust oil pressure. When do we adjust oil pressure? When the engine's hot or when it's cold? Well, as a mechanic, you want to do it when it's cold, but what are you supposed well, to... The, the, the Q&A said that that stuff comes pre-adjusted. It, it was like a question or something like that. I was like kind of weird about that. All right, so if the factory overhauled your engine or a very reputable shop that did a test run, yes, the oil pressure should already be adjusted when you get there. But let's just say you need to adjust the oil pressure for some reason. How do you do it? Or when do you do it? When it's hot or when it's cold? Oh, when it's hot. Yeah, you want to do it at operating temperature. So you have the pilot go fly it. He comes back, says, hey, my oil pressure, I'd like it to be up a little bit. Now, of course, it's up to you to say, wait a minute. 
how long has it been low? Is it getting low? I mean, what's going on? It's it's normal. It's going to wear. It's going to kind of wear down slowly. And, you know, if the pilot comes in and says, eh, I'd like you to bump the oil pressure up a little bit. Oh, what's going on? Eh, you know, over the last couple hundred hours, I've just, it's a little bit less, a little bit less. Oh, okay, so you got some wear going on. Crank it up. Give them some oil pressure. It's not a big deal. But they come in one day, goes, yeah, it's always been like 60. And now it's like, you know, just like 31, you know. It's like, okay, we got a problem we might want to look at here, you know. <laughs> Uh, what would be the first thing you would suspect? Bearings. Rings. rings. Not rings. Warning pump. Uh, your, your, your gears, your teeth. Don't Maybe warn pump. Blockage. 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 Uh, that should probably be. something holding up <coughs> All great ones. No. How about the gauge? <laughs> Most of these aircraft are 40 to 50 years old. What's the... It's a, you'll learn about gauges. It's a board on two gauge in a lot of them, which is literally a spiral of copper. And as pressure gets in there, it straightens out and makes the needle move. So what happens to that copper after 50 years of flexing? Yeah. Mm. Starts to work hard and it starts to lie and say that it's low, oh, yeah. right? Now, if they've got some sort of, you know, nice looking color screen TV about yay big putting out numbers, I'd think, oh, that's probably right, but I would double check it. Gauges are almost always the problem. All right, so you have the pressure gallery in all other Lycomings except for the two. You have a right and left crankcase oil header, if you want to call it header, which means you have pressure on both sides. You guys only had it on one side, yeah. but it crosses over and goes both sides. And it's similar to then from there what you would have. Um, you have pressure going into your... Um, main bearings which then go into the crankshaft and we've already looked at how it goes to the transfer tube goes to the crank pins from the crank pins sprays out um let me see what do we got we should have a i was looking for the piston cooling nozzles they didn't put it in this one so um the other side is going to go to our tappets push rods off to the cylinders so gravity oil through push rods the rocker arms all right, we got that? Mm -hmm. Makes sense to everybody? And that's all I'm going to say about that. They do, uh, they repair those old gauges and stuff like that? Can you can send it to like a, a, a instrument shop or something? Any, yeah. Any instrument you have to send somewhere, right? It's such a big, nobody wants them anymore. It's, we, all, we all want the JPI stuff. Oh, oh like on yours? Yeah. Oh, they're cheap. You just have a single gauge. Right, like Scott, Scott Gage. Temp and, it's temp and don't pressure. It's both. Oh, yeah, I think there are some people that, that do repair them. Because, yeah, you want the original in yours because it looks nice. So, yeah. I know some people who aren't qualified to do it who <laughs> just do it. They send it to, like, because there's places to do it for cars. Yeah. And so they'll send it to something like that, you know. Did this come out? Yeah. All right. So we have the wet sump. That's the most typical. Most typical. Um, yeah. Well, let's say it has an oil sump on the bottom of the engine. They all do, really. Um, I'm just going to leave it at that. Wet sump. Kind of went over the wet sump. It's what you have. All right. And then we have the dry, dry sump. sump. Which is kind of a misnomer. It's not really a dry sump. There's a sump down there, and it's very wet. And what's it got in it? Oil. It has oil. Um, yeah, a couple minutes. All right, dry sump. So we have uh, most radials. I think all radials. Most, most, uh, most all radials. I don't know of any that aren't, because what is on the bottom of there? Got cylinders. Got cylinders right there. Okay. Um, let's see. Most radials. Inverted engines. Inverted engines, um, some opposed. Like, for example, the V-tail Bonanza. That has a dry sump in it. Um, I think this, ooh, I'm trying to think the Cirrus. They just have a really small sump, I think. Um, so why would, that, why, why would the uh, V-tail have a dry sump with a six-cylinder Continental? And it didn't have enough room to put a sump down there that held enough oil. So it's just a flat pan with a very 
Huh? I mean, they do too, I think. I just said Vito because ours are over there. So yeah, some Bonanzas will do that because they just didn't have enough room. And the nose gear comes up, the engine's right there. They don't have room for a sump. So they got to put a tank somewhere else. So dry sump is always going to have an oil tank somewhere else. Because if it doesn't hold a bunch of oil, then where are you going to put it? In a tank. Where's the tank mounted? On the firewall. So let me see. Yeah, uh, dry sump. So as a remote tank. Uh, I think all of the Rotax are dry sumps. All right, we'll break.